Hello YouTube, LJ Draco here. Yes, it's been a while. Um, as you can tell, my throat is getting so much better. Thank you to all those who wished me well, and you know, and, and to my friend Sasha for recommending him and his mum recommending some healing techniques, uh, things to use, things to have that could help. Um, just thank you. Uh, it has helped. Uh, my throat is getting just a, a little bit, it's a little bit groggy. Uh, I've been coughing all day, but. Hey, there's a couple of videos I'm doing all in a row. Um, you tell by the title which one this one is. This one is just the top 15 movies from my childhood. Now let me see if I've got that title correct because I've got my notes. Yes, but it's not just top 10 or top 15 movies from my childhood. It's also the top 15 Blu-rays I'm happy to own from my childhood. So it's... A bit of a, a bit of a weird list, but in the end, I'm happy because uh, these are movies that I never thought I'd own. I've got LED lights plugged into the back of my TV, and um, yeah, for some reason they keep going on and off. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> it was very distracting. I didn't know where the light was coming from. I just kept seeing this light flicker in the background. And um, it was winding me up to no end. Anyway, back to the video. So this is the top 15 movies and Blu-rays that I owned from my childhood. But also I grew up watching and enjoyed. Uh, now, I know I've already delayed a little bit. But before I get properly into the video... Me, ghosty. <laughs> I have another fluffy friend I can introduce. That sounded really wrong. <laughs> okay, she's <laughs> she's not a fluffy friend. She's another cuddly toy that um, Alice pointed out to me that I <laughs> that I, I got uh, the other day. Uh, now I get most of my stuff from charity shops and that, and this is an actual. Build a bear, a Ghostbusters official, and uh, I picked it up for one pound fifty. So yeah, so soft. Oh. Right, Ghosty can stand there and watch the video. Right, so this is yeah, these are movies that I grew up with, um, I enjoyed, and I'll just give little quick segments as to why. Toy Story 2. Now, a lot of people are going to ask why not Toy Story 1. Toy Story 1 is a classic and it, by definition, is the better movie out of all three. Reason why this one spoke too much to me as a kid is because of, of the way this story was told compared to the first one. Um, as you know, as collectors are, I kind of understand why the guy in this movie wanted the complete set. He had spent all of his life building up the Woody's Roundup gang collectibles from china plates to cardboard cutouts to uh, novelty items to records he had collected all of these things and god knows how old the guy must have been late 30s early 40s and the only thing he needed was a prestige Woody so I mean in his eyes regardless if it was a family heirloom if it meant something to a kid it's a, a collectible, and and you gotta think he's got a, he's got his own like toy store kind of thing, but he really wanted to get out of that. He just wanted to get a big collection, sell it on, get a lot of money, so he could start living a new life. He was a bit of a douche, but we kind of feel for him a little bit in this movie that he just wanted to complete a set so he could get the money, and he wasn't selling it to just some random people who were going to destroy it. He was selling it to other collectors who wanted it in a museum. To be displayed. A complete collection. And I, I, I feel for that. But not only that. Jesse's story. Uh, was so emotional. And the way she shows. How she was treated. Is how kids treat their toys as they get older. You know. I mean not well, not all of us. Some still respect and you know treat our toys decently. But it was just. That little life where this girl loved her so much, then as she started getting older, she started getting into boys, makeup, and how she just got thrown under bed. When she was finally found again, she was just dumped on the side of the road, like, 
there was no more tie to her. There was no more love. And she was just abandoned. And the fact that Woody was going to leave his family to make a new one forever. Uh, it, it, there's just so much to this movie that, that was more enjoyable and a, to appreciate as a kid. James and the Giant Peach. Now, the only reason this is on my list is because there were only two Roald Dahl movies, well, Roald Dahl books that I fell in love with as, as a kid. Only two that I'd ever read. Now, I don't read that often, and I didn't as a kid. But the only two Roald Dahl books I would read is this and another one which has a, a movie in this list. And um, there's just something about this movie that, that brings that book to life. And I didn't expect it to. Now, I'm going to say such an embarrassing factor of this. I did not know all my life of watching this that this was a Disney. And I have seen this movie hundreds and hundreds of times. I've known for the past few years. I've known for about three years now. But three years ago, or four years ago, when I was only collecting DVDs, and I wasn't collecting Blu-rays whatsoever, I never knew James the Giant, uh, Giant Peach was a Disney, because the case it came in didn't say Disney on it. It was just like a white background, little peach, and all the characters were down here. And then when you put the disc in, it came up with the Walt Disney Castle logo. And I was like, when the hell was this a Disney film? Never knew it. Never once. Um, but there's, uh, when you read the book, I mean, people say that your imagination is endless. You know, it can go on forever. Not true if you're me. My imagination has a stopping point. And this showed beyond what I could dream. And um, I, I just fell in love with it as a kid. And it, it gave me a sense of how books can become magical at some point. Right, the next two are really speaking to who I am. Now, as a kid, and I, I grew up with a, big, a large family, uh, me and my brothers, we all had a passion for Pokemon. And we all loved the show, we loved collecting the cards, and we loved playing Pokemon games and stuff. But when this movie came out, we were all stunned and shocked at how great a Pokemon story could be and this was one of the first movies as a kid that we watched which showed how life can feel to some people now the whole point of this story I'm sorry you're probably going to see a lot of knocking of the microphone I do apologize my professional microphone is kaput I can't use it I don't know why and I don't know when I'm going to get another one because I don't make that many videos so I do apologize for the weird audio here this guy is a clone of this. But this guy, Mewtwo, uh, he, he, he was being controlled at the beginning. You know, he was being used by a government. And then he got peed off because he's like, hang on, I'm, I'm my own being. I'm not a Pokemon. And I'm not a human. You created me. So I'm neither of these things. I'm something different. I'm just me. And he wanted to prove that he just being him could be more powerful than if he was either of the other things. But it was due to this Pokemon... Ash and Pikachu, which at some point shows him in the story that humans and Pokemon can live side by side. That doesn't have to be a fight. There doesn't have to be a war. There doesn't have to be Pokemon against humans or humans against. They could be just together and live on a planet as just normal people could. And seeing that in a child's movie gave us definition that, you know, just because something may look different, sound different and feel different doesn't mean it is. They could still be similar to us in any way people just because other people speak in different languages doesn't mean that like we're different we're still humans we still have the same blood uh, we still have dna we still live we're just the same so seeing that as a kid was something awesome this next one's just for pure nostalgic reasons to my heart though <laughs> <laughs> Now, the reason this is on my list... Now, okay, fair enough. This was not out when I was, like, really, really young. This came out when I was about seven years old. So I was still quite young. The only reason this is on my list is because... The first time I ever watched this was my, my friend from primary school. His...
dad went to China for a holiday and they had the DVD released there months before we ever got it. And um, it wasn't a bootleg one or anything. It was just it was just a chance. So you had to have the subtitles on. But I loved Yu-Gi-Oh! And it was, it was his first movie. So I fell in love with it instantly. The only reason this is in my... Like in my whole glad to own. Is because this would not have been released if I didn't nag manga. <laughs> I promised I'd never say it again but I had to. I nagged manga to death about this. Me and I finally got a friend to join in. And we just, we, we kept sending constant bombardment, and they were like, we don't have the rights to it. We don't have the rights to it. We can't make it. I'm sorry. A couple of months later, trailer, going into cinemas, first time restored. We'll be getting a Blu-ray release. And I was like, see, I told you. <laughs> nag. If you nag, it happens. Um, but yeah, it's a fun movie. And it made me appreciate the show a bit more. Dragon Heart is the next one. Now, this is what started me my love for dragons. This is um I've been obsessed with dragons since I first saw this. Um there was another film that I watched at the same time, but it didn't give me the love for a dragon as much as Draco. Draco Um <laughs> This is just um yeah, this is what inspired me to the idea of thinking that dragons could maybe hopefully one day exist. They'd probably be nothing like him. They'd probably eat my face and then shit me out from the other side. <laughs> but you can hope. The point is, um, yeah, this gave me belief in something bigger and beautiful that could exist one day. And, you know, it gave me a passion to study these mythical creatures as if they were real. You know, and, and I've loved that ever since. Plus, it's a great story. Sean Connery. <laughs> Ernest Scared Stupid. The best Ernest movie to exist. Um, the most in most enjoyable. Uh, all of them are in fantastic and incredible. I can't... I think other than... <sighs> I don't know. I think other than Goes to Africa... It's just because I think he didn't, you could tell by his acting, he didn't want to do that one. It's not because of where it was set. It was just because you could tell he did not like the script. His, his scenes were not that great. He was not enjoying that, that part whatsoever. Um, and actually in the army, he did not like in the army. You can tell by his reaction in that as well. But Ernest Scared Stupid is the best Ernest movie. Just because it's funny. It's slightly terrifying, but it's... It's heartwarming, it's emotional, there's so much that this gives and Jim Varney, you know, he was just a lovable entertainer and he gave children so much hope that one day we could be funny. Plus, I had the outfit, I had the earnest outfit growing up, so yeah, that's me. Gremlins. I was not supposed to watch this as a kid. <laughs> I was told I wasn't allowed to because it gave me nightmares. This did not give me nightmares. I loved it. Gizmo is one of the most lovable little creatures in film history altogether. Um, I think more people would want Gizmo to be real than dragons. And I, c I can't blame them to be fair. Other than the whole concept of you get them wet, they multiply. Although you could just... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making that joke. No, that, that's for a different time. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, um, it was just an, a very unique, interesting story. You know, the characters were good. The, I mean, the, the concept of, you know, if you feed them after midnight, what happens? If you get them wet, what happens? And if they hit sunlight. And it was nice to see how, even though he gets tortured every time it happens, it was nice to see he was, like, defending the humans. He was like, you're not going to harm my real family. And... It was just so cool. Joe Dante did a great job in this. It was amazing. Hook. I have a top five Robin Williams list. If you want to see that video at some point, let me know in the description below. And I'll do my top five favourite Robin Williams performances. This, however, is definitely in that. And I'd seen the original Disney Peter Pan and I did enjoy it. I thought it was a great movie. But you always did ask, like, what happens? Like, is that it? Is that the only thing we're going to know now is that he takes them to Wendy's? And, you know, and 
this gave a great idea of how if Peter Pan ever did decide to stop living in Neverland, what could happen? How could his life turn out? But yet again, another thing is, it took me about 15 years to realise that that was Dunstan Hoffman. <laughs> I didn't know who he was. Oh, it's funny. But I really did enjoy I think Robin Williams did a great job in this. And it's one of the most rewatchable Robin Williams films of all time. Indian in the Cupboard. I finally got my Region A Indian in the Cupboard release. Oh, this and Never Any Story back to back are like the two best things you could do. Just sit there one night, don't do nothing else. This and Never Any Story, just back to back. Great night. No, I'm telling you now, there is not one person, adult or child, who watched this film and didn't just look around the house for little random cupboards with little locks or, or walked into any kind of shop and saw these little tiny keys and went, oh, there must be a cupboard that belongs to it and get all their action figures and put them in the cupboards. And who put their figures in the kitchen cupboards? Like, just closing it up and see if they come. If you didn't, then it's just me and now I feel embarrassed. <laughs> and it, it... Stupid Mike. It gave... Yet again, it gave kids that hope that, oh my God, we can actually make our toys come to life and we can talk to them. This is incredible. You know, and um, the scene where, like, you got Darth Vader and Robocop and a dinosaur just all fighting each other. Incredible. <laughs> Yet again, it, it, it made me feel happy inside as, as a kid at the time. Like, there was a chance it could happen. You know, imagination runs wild. Iron Giant, now, for children at the age I was, now I don't exactly, I think this 1999 this came out, so I was six years old. Now, for kids my age back then, or for kids that age now, this was at that point in the 90s, this was the only robot kind of movie that kids could watch. And enjoy. You know, there weren't that many robot related kids' movies at the time. The only one that I could know of was the short circuit movies, and a lot of the kids back then weren't really allowed. I don't know why, there was something about 80s movies that parents didn't want their kids to see, apart from my dad. <laughs> he was just like, watch what you want, as long as you don't tell your mum. <laughs> But this this was, and the great thing about it is it helps kids kind of ease into the idea of death. Which, you don't want kids to know, you know, because then they start asking questions. But the conversation between the Iron Giant and Hugo was amazing. You know, when, when the kid had to explain to this giant robot why things just stop existing. Where they may go when they do, you know. Is it real? We don't know, but would you like to believe it is? Of course you would. And that, as a kid, you kind of go like, oh, okay, that's that's pretty interesting. And it, it helps sink that idea into kids' heads, you know, better than if a parent tried to explain or if a stranger tried to explain. If a stranger tries to explain a concept to you, run away. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like, at the time, this was just one of those movies. But you fell in love with the Iron Giant. He was cool. Another one. <laughs> Jumanji was awesome. All right, I'm sorry. The only reason this is definitely is because not only is it a great performance by Ron Williams, not only is it a great movie with an interesting story, not only is it something new at the time, but how many people decided to pull out the Monopoly board and go, come on, <laughs> let this be real. Give me the money. <laughs> Yet again, just me. Seems to be alone on a lot of these things. <laughs> but yet again, it, it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those ones that you can sit down and you can enjoy with the entire family. And also, it showed, don't be horrible to your kids or to your parents. Because you never know what might happen. I mean, how many parents used that as an excuse back, back in the 90s? To, right, Timmy? Right, you play up again, I'm getting a Jumanji out. No! No! You'll go to the jungle for 15 years. <laughs> Guarantee it would happen. <laughs> uh, do you know what, if, if anyone was parents in the nineties, please tell me if you did that to your kids. <laughs> I'm just evil. <laughs> okay, as I mentioned, 
never ending story. And yet again, there's another film that I really enjoyed because I read the book. I I actually bought but before I watched the film, before I knew there was a film, um, at a school fair, I think I was in year one, year two, there was this big red book and it had the snake symbol on the front. And I was reading it. And as I was reading, I was thinking, wow, this is actually really interesting. And it felt like someone was reading the story to me whilst I was reading it. And I got really intrigued by that. I got halfway through and I turned around to my family and I said, this is a really good book. And they were like, what book? Oh, the book I picked up from the fate. They said, which one? It's a never ending story. And then my mum and dad turned around and goes, they released a film of that. And then we, I watched the film as I was reading the book. And, wow, it just, it was a very weird experience because it was like someone on the screen was doing what I was telling them to, telling them to do while the person in the book was telling me the story. <laughs> but it was really nice and refreshing to know that a lot of the film was in the book. Okay, there's a lot in the book that wasn't in the film, obviously, because it's a big book. But the parts you were reading, it was tying in and tying in. And it gave you a bit, like I said, your imagination. Everyone says it can, it's endless, but it isn't. There is a limit to how much you can think about. And this was helping your imagination stretch further than if you were just trying to think of it yourself. I wouldn't imagine the big rock creature looking anything like this. Right? I wouldn't have pictured the elf creature looking like that with the bat. No, I wouldn't have pictured this guy on this. I would have just pictured something, especially Falcor. He was the second dragon that I fell in love with. You know, you don't think about it, but you do. This film was my favourite film until Moulin Rouge. <laughs> Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now, oh, my dad got in so much trouble when he showed me this film. Um, I was really young at the time, and I, yet again, fell in love with it the music was great the characters were amazing frank franklin for hilarious riff raff amazing my favorite character is columbia who i'll put here lil nell oh. she i i swore to everyone i knew i was going to marry her one day how your dreams don't go to plan but i met someone and i'm happy with her you all know that woman She'll kill me if I don't say it. <laughs> I was joking. That she's not even in the room. I think. <laughs> but it was just something about this that was dark. It was weird. It was twisted. But I, I danced a lot to the music. Nah, I liked it. Small Soldiers. And this is actually... This and now Indian in the Cupboard are probably my two most... Favorite. I've got a top five favorite Blu-rays I own entirely, like the prize of my collection. Uh, this is one of them. Small Soldiers. I love this as a kid as well. I have the 12-inch Archer and Chip right over there on the desk. I have the new improved Chip, which I I showed on Instagram what I meant. Um, but yeah, Joe Dante, another amazing amazing masterpiece and yet again it also gave you hope i say yet again a lot now i don't know why i always say these one words every so often quite a lot but it, it gave us that that thought of you know oh, maybe we could get toys that could walk and talk with us you know instead of having to actually hold them yourself and reposition them they could just do it themselves and you can just give them a story you know we were lazy kids <laughs> we made everything to do it for us and the idea that was amazing, and I like the fact that you know the Gorgonites were designed to lose, but they do the they do decide to fight back. How the Commando Elite, you know, they're not they weren't actually evil. They weren't this horrible group of soldiers. They were military. They were sent to do one thing: kill monsters. But because of their programming and because of the the chips that was put in them, they didn't have the the capacity to learn. That the monsters weren't a threat and that the monsters weren't evil. They had a prime directive. They had to go for it. So they went for it. And the last one. And this is another. This is the other Roald Dahl story. That 
I ever read. I said I only read two of his books all the way through. And James the Giant Peach was one of them. And this is my favourite. And the reason I'm, I'm looking a bit serious is because I still remember the first time I ever watched this film. And I could not remember a more magical time in my childhood. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Gene Wilder played Willy Wonka probably the best anyone ever can. He is just... He, he Even though in a lot of his films he seems to play a similar character, it's the fact that he's similar, but with a twist that always gives his performances that sense of amazement. You know, and uh, he he was terrifyingly awesome in this. You know, the, the story of all these people who found the tickets. You had the ovary and um, Russian. You know, you had the, the bratty British girl, pompous. You had the snotty, challenging American girl. You had the TV obsessed kid, and then you had the poor boy, you know. And the the fact that he he wished it so much that he could have it, and it happened. But not only did he wish it, I mean, because all he wanted to do was just go to the factory. So all he ever wanted was just to go there. He didn't care if he won. He didn't care if he got anything special for it. He just wanted to go. He wanted to see Willy Wonka. He wanted to see the man who made his favourite chocolate. Can't blame the man for that. And instead, he gets more. And it's because he's not selfish. It's because he's not greedy. It's because he's not this pain in the ass of a spoiled brat. It's because he didn't want or expect anything other than just to see the man who made his childhood worth living in the state it was. And that's what will make this film here, whether it's on VHS, whether it's on Blu-ray, whether it's on 4K, whether it's DVD, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what platform this movie will ever be on. It is why that this movie will always be in the top 10 most amazing movies of all time on probably anyone's list. If If they had to really think about movies that genuinely made impact on their life I'm pretty sure this would be there because it speaks to everybody that's that's why it's there right this video is about half an hour long and I've still got like one to two more videos to do so I'm gonna leave it here and then you'll see the next two videos so Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video and previous videos, don't forget to strike the like for future videos. If you're new to my channel or anything a couple of my videos, click that subscribe button down below. I'd surely appreciate it. Anyway, take care, you wonderful, wonderful people. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.